but and then we're gonna come to the audience and we're gonna hear your thoughts, big questions, responses. Um, and it's two mics right in the center here for you all. So we're gonna start with Sima Suko, who is the new deputy artistic director at Arena Stage. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for this research. It is um, powerful, potent, and um, even as I sit here, I've read the research uh, several times. And even as I sit here and hear it again, I find myself feeling pulled in uh, two directions of um, feeling both reflected and empowered, but I also find I feel deeply sad about it as well. Um, I've been asked to um, reflect on the research through the lens of mentorship. Uh, and I think that's because I've been the beneficiary of some tremendously impactful uh, mentorship opportunities. I've had many mentors, some are sitting in the audience today. Uh, but for the sake of this discussion, I'll um, be speaking about uh, two mentors, two mentorship opportunities that weren't just mentors, but were um, sponsorships. Um, and these were places where uh, my mentor opened the door, didn't just mentor, but sponsored me up. Uh, and that was uh, Sheldon Epps, artistic director at the Pasadena Playhouse, with whom I had begun a, what I call, drive-by mentorship in 2011, where I'd meet with him once a quarter and he then hired me in 2014 as his associate artistic director. And then Molly Smith, artistic director at Arena Stage, who, with whom I had a formalized mentorship through the incredible TCG Leadership U grant opportunity, and uh, who recently hired me as deputy artistic director at Arena Stage. So as I reflect on those two um, mentorship turned sponsorship opportunities, a lot of times people ask me, um, how do you, how'd you get that job? And, um, because in neither of these cases did I ask them for a, a job. Um, they called me up with the opportunity. But that's because we had this robust mentorship in place. So I've been trying to think about and dissect those mentorships. And I, I've come up with sort of three commonalities of them uh, that led to this sponsorship opportunity. Um, the first is uh, timing, that what, with both of these individuals, when, when we met, when we entered into a mentorship together, um, they were ready in their careers to be tremendous mentors and to create space. Um, and then I was also ready to be mentored. I, I had already founded a company and spent many years trying to prove, prove, prove myself. I was ready to improve. So the timing was right uh, in both of those cases. The second thing was um, mutuality in these mentorships. Uh, and what I mean by that is while the mentorship may have started with a mentor and mentee, over time it shifted and um, we became peers. Um, and I'll maybe share one story. Uh, through, through the Leadership U opportunity at TCG while I was at Arena Stage, um, well, one of the questions that was on my mind that I told Molly was, to Lord or not to Lord? That was the question. <laughs> but I had, a, had founded a theater company. I was wondering, do I want to stay at my theater company or do I want to shift to a Lord? Underneath that question was, do I have anything to offer a Lord? And would I feel, could I survive in a Lord structure? So um, at my uh, theater company I had founded, we had created a couple of... Um, Methodologies, uh, consensus organizing for theater, which is an artistic methodology uh, rooted in community organizing and audience uh, development, uh, and the Green Theater Choices Toolkit, which was about greening our theater industry. So in my mentorship with Molly, I said I wanted to test these out and see if they can live in a large structure. So she sponsored me into a meeting with Edgar, the executive director. We presented these ideas. He said, oh, what a great idea. They sponsored me into senior staff. We presented these ideas. They then sponsored me into their own departments, um, which gave me the, the space to be able to test out these ideas. The conclusions we came to together um, were that, um, yes, 
uh, to Lord. <laughs> I, had, um, I had something to offer a Lord, and I could find a way to navigate a complex organization, though I was coming from a small organization I had founded. Um, so that's what I mean about mutuality. I had something to offer in these mentorships that shifted the power dynamic. Um, the third commonality that I've identified is, uh, in these mentorships was vulnerability. Um, that with both these mentors, I was able to be um, openly self-critical about my own work safely. And I'll share one story. Um, in my drive by mentorships with Sheldon Epps, I would drive up from San Diego once a quarter. We'd have lunch, and I'd talk about what was going on at Mo'olelo Performing Arts Company. He'd talk about what's going on at Pasadena Playhouse. And these were very nice gatherings. But I remember after about, I think it might have been the third one, he, said, he asked me, how's it going? And I said, you know, I just uh, completed a production, and it really didn't go as well as I would have liked it to go. And he said, why? And I said, well, I was thinking about the rehearsal room, and I think maybe I micromanaged uh, my lead actor. I saw him, sitting across from me at lunch, shift from leaning back to leaning forward. And he said, okay, let's talk more about that. And we started dissecting this, and all of a sudden we became two artists who are peers um, willing to be vulnerable with one another about our work, and I felt that as a tremendous turning point in our relationship. So, as I reflect on the research through this lens of mentorship, uh, for me, again, these mentorships that then turned into sponsorships, the commonalities were the right time, a sense of mutuality, and vulnerability, safe vulnerability. So, that's it. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Schaefer Mazo, but my mom calls me Stephanie, so <laughs> they explain a bit why I'm up here today. Um, I've been asked to respond to the research through the lens of intersectionality um, and the complexity of diversity. Um, so intersectionality that, that holds that no singular experience of identity is, is mm -hmm sums up an entire person. Um, so when I looked at the research, um, I was really pleased to see that the researchers included this concept pretty fundamentally in the work that's being done in terms of gender parity can't be disassociated or uncoupled with other forms of uh, multiple and simultaneous uh, discrimination. So, uh, the, there's a couple, I, I helped to develop this pro project and do early fundraising for it, and there was a consensus in, in the field that um, this issue of gender parity was not as important as other diversity issues at the moment, which was very disheartening to me, as I assure it is to everybody. Um, because I think the gender parity movement and women's equality has been asked to step back so many times. Um, and I have faced personally where there have been certain types of minority positions that have been, uh, minority positions that have been put in, in a hierarchy of importance, which I think is just not useful to anybody and doesn't promote genuine, authentic uh, include, uh, inclusion and equity. So what I, what I take from this um, is that with all of these steps that we can, that we can make to uh, improve uh, the day-to-day -day circumstances that would make gender parity possible, we also need to uh, parallel that with examination of what bias and unconscious bias is. So in my particular perspective, I've been very privileged to have the uh, career that I have, to have been given opportunities that I have, which is ultimately and completely tied to my education, my socioeconomic status, um, and circumstances of my birth. I acknowledge that, but um, not all women look the same. 
as what I want to say, womanhood is not a singular experience. And, and to that also, um, gender in the 21st century is a different complexity than it was in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So that I believe firmly that fight for, uh, that feminism is not about preferencing one gender over another. It's about eliminating discrimination based on gender and gender presentation. It does not match. Mm -hmm. um, so since identity is so complex and it can't all be tackled at once, and diversity is equally complex, we do have to take steps towards um, rectifying systematization of oppression and discrimination. But I would challenge us all, as an industry and as individuals, to recognize that we all have unconscious biases and conscious biases, and while we are putting systems in place to make the field more equitable, uh, that we understand and sort of examine why or how we can say, I trust you even if you don't look like me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, wow, I, um, I used to be afraid of numbers as a kid, and uh, when I came across statistical analyses and data reports, I found that they could be complex and heavy, but summaries and recommendations are what I always be holding on to. Um, what excited me most about uh, this report were the recommendations, because I had been experiencing firsthand some things in motion with the inside of an institution like TCG, but um, also seeing that there's clearly so much more work to be had. Yeah. I'm going to share two points from the study that were particularly resonant with me as I, as I think about my own journey to this point. One, familiarity and trust in potential. Hmm. What a theater leader needs to look like, white and male, because white and male leaders have been the long-standing majority in top positions. Uh, before TCG, for many years, I, I worked with a very small and nimble, yet fierce art service organization dedicated to strengthening Asian American arts and cultural workers uh, in New York City. I received calls with folks who had brilliant Asian ideas, um, Asian director for traditional performances as part of Diversity Day for a corporation made up primarily of white men <laughs> calling upon the small Asian arts group and I, as an Asian woman, was ready to deliver and that was where I was placed to be of use. Um, there are a lot of folks striving for diversity but are we asking the right questions and who are we asking and I think that this report really really hits the nail on the head in many ways. And I had many questions back then and I, and I definitely still do now, particularly around intersectionality. Um, I'd see lots of women on stage and wonder where are the women of color on stage and how about women of color in leadership positions in the theater off stage? On my personal path to leadership roles, I had, I learned that I had to be nimble with what I had. When I didn't see myself in spaces, I tried to create my own pathway to access and look to community. I, I looked to folks who understood and were invested in making change beyond just diversity for the sake of looking like the next big thing or something that was cool. Right. I have so much respect for, respect for folks continuing to do the work, the very important work on the grassroots level to serve the community, but um, you know, this report really goes to show that there needs to be a balance in representation on a much larger scale, and I, I quickly saw that this wasn't going to happen with me hoping and praying that folks were going to see me beyond just being an Asian American and a woman, but that folks should be able to see me as those things, and then some. Two, culture fit. Mm. Sounds kind of trendy, but. Uh, 
Now, what to do once someone is diversifying a larger institution, or rather, what systems are in place to really thoughtfully support diversifying leadership? You know, uh, whether I like it or not, I, I've been socialized one way or the other to read the male experience as uh, this kind of universal experience, mm. uh, something that we should hope to measure to, and it, and it gets really dangerous when a theater's culture gets so used to this climate. So, you know, the culture fit point in the report was particularly interesting because, yes, it reminded me of the times I'd get calls almost randomly for Asian musicians quite out of context to plug into a corporation absent of diversity for this kind of quick plug-and-play version. Uh, and my own questions about large-scale institutions, even like TCG, I had heard about um, before being able to proudly call this place a true culture striving to work towards change. Uh, I do want to share also that unlike many reports that I've reviewed in the Wellesley study, it was very heartening though to see such thoughtful recommendations laid out, but also knowing that this work has started already at so many different places and it's going to take so much time. Uh, particularly on the section of what individual theaters and service organizations do, I was really happy to see that um, you know there were so many things that TCG was hitting, ranging from correcting instances of gender and racial bias, opening up conversations in the context of different programs, creating opportunities, but, but that's just one institution when this report covers so many theaters. Um, so just to share on an institutional end um, some of the things that TCG is currently doing to, to hit things on the gender parenting note, um, a lot of our major decisions are focused around this. Grant making publications, um, choosing speakers for conferences, American theater and our continued research on gender parity, at the intersection sections within our national conferences on gender parity. And this is the key, I think, for, for TCG. We have sessions like men for gender justice sessions. You know, I think it's important for women to support women, but male allies are, are just as important in different cases. Um, uh, another thing for TCG in particular, uh, through the work of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Institute, is thinking beyond gender binary, particularly in building analysis um, including trans and gender non-conforming identities. I think that's really key. So, I mean, to summarize, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things going on in the works within the institution. I wanted to share a little bit about um, my personal point of view. And, you know, as a late stage millennial, if, if you will, <laughs> have the privilege of being able to be in this room with folks okay. from different unique journeys, you know, it's easy to feel at ease with you know, a lot of groundbreaking milestones for women, particularly in the media, but, but I'm not satisfied, and I, I don't think that we should be, especially with having a nice report. Yeah. So anyway, um, you know, thanks again, uh, Carrie and Erin and Bethany and, and the team at Wellesley for, for this, because it's, it's definitely a start, and there's going to be a lot of pushback, and hopefully, <laughs> The pushback, yes. Um, hopefully, we can, you know, pull from some of the findings here and work together as as a community. Um, it, it's not about pointing fingers. It's really about, hey, there's something going on here, and it's 2016, and and and, and I'm in my 30s, my early 30s, and yes, I'm still aspiring, but you know, I want to look towards the future and and not just hope that things are going to change, but work with folks to actually make change. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Annie Kaufman. I'm a freelance director um, and a board member of SDC. I live in New York City. And um, I agree that I, I also read the, um, the report over and over again, but sitting in this room with all of you and hearing you guys sort of go through it live has sort of sent my, you know, sent me a little bit reeling. And I, I feel like there's um, 
something that you guys brought up that, that sort of I'm, I sort of like shifting what I was going to talk about. So this might be a little um, all over the place. So I apologize for that. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say, uh, you know, Zelda's name has been brought up several times uh, today, and um, what's lovely about being in this room with all of you is I don't really know many of you, so um, the story that I'm about to tell, I, I, I've told a lot of people, but not to you guys, so, <laughs> um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I, I'm a little bit late to the, the party about being uh, outraged at the uh, statistics of uh, women in the theater. Um, and one of the reasons that is, is when I came, when I graduated from UCSD, I got my MFA there directing, and I returned to New York City, and I had an interview with Zelda. I was supposed to, I was interviewing for um, a job with MFA uh, actors doing um, a Shaw piece. And, um, and she took me through, you know, this interview, and at one point she asked me, she said, so you know, how's it going? How's it going now that you're back from graduate school? And um, I said, yeah, you know, it's okay, it's hard. Um, it's hard being a woman director. And she just looked at me. And she said, what? <laughs> and I said, you know, it's hard being a woman direct director. She's like, well, uh. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I felt like I didn't get the job, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I did not get the job, um, but I thought the, the sort of takeaway for me at that point was, wow, right, I, um, I, I'm talking to this woman who's basically responsible for a, a regional theater and the nonprofit movement. Um, so she started in, what, the 50s, you know, at a time when all sorts of things were against us and more, you know. Um, and I think she even translated Russian documents in the World War II, okay? So this is a woman who, like, um, and here I am, a, you know, a debutante from Phoenix, Arizona, coming, you know, saying this to her. So anyway, um, I learned, I thought, okay, this is a great lesson. I'm going to put my head down, and I'm going to do my work, and I'm not going to talk about being a woman. And I'm going to, um, and hopefully recognition and jobs will come because of my good work, et cetera. So I did. I put my head down, and um, I did my work, and yeah, I mean, you know, it worked. Uh, it worked for a while, and then I lifted my head, uh, you know, up from the grindstone, a few years ago, and looked around and thought, like, here I am, still here I am in this position. And um, because I had my nose to the grindstone for so long, I didn't realize that, you know, everyone else had sort of advanced. Um, people of not my gender. So, um, <laughs> and so I thought to myself, right, isn't this crazy that Zelda Fitchandler basically built the house, right, that we're all living in, and we are not running it. Yet. I mean, we are not actually, and there are rooms that I'm not even allowed into, and there are rooms that I don't even know exist. Um, there are opportunities that I don't even know exist. Um, so, uh, so that was a sort of wake up call to me. Um, anyway, so I'm here sort of talking about, uh, I think, I think all alternative um, definitions of leadership because. I, for one, and I've had many conversations uh, with the people up here, <laughs> and um, I don't want to be an artistic director um, of, a, of, a, of a Lord Theater, of any theater at the moment. Um, it, it's frightening to me, it, or frightening, I, I feel, it feels claustrophobic to me, and um, I, I, you know, to be sort of tied to a, to a theater. Um, I really love my, my freelance um, life. It's a hard life, but um, I do, I like my freedom. Um, and so I asked myself, what is leadership then? What, is, what does leadership look like then in this, uh, you know, if, if it's not to be a leader of, of a theater? Um, and I've been pondering this uh, over the past few years, and uh, I think a leader is someone who takes responsibility for a community, for their betterment, for their well-being, um, and for the cultivation, right? So that, doesn't, that, that can mean many, many things. Um, and around that time, I joined uh, the SDC board, um, and uh, and with the amazing leadership of Laura Penn, whom we've already mentioned today, uh, that is an organization for directors and choreographers. It's basically like a grassroots activist organization helping directors with um, visibility and diversity and promotion. Um, and I know it sounds crazy, but uh, Directors in this country have a very different kind of uh, recognition than they do in other countries. Um, this is a playwrights uh, 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 nation, and it should be. Playwrights are incredibly important, but I think that you know 
we, uh, we are also artists in our own right. So that is something that we are promoting. And something that um, you guys were talking about in terms of leadership and the kind of um, uh, mystery surrounding how does one become a leader in this, you know, in, in this field. And I think that the, part of the issue um, in the theater is we're so, uh, we're so in love with our own mystery and we're so in love with the, you know, protecting the rehearsal room and the <laughs> magic that happens in the rehearsal room and no one's allowed in. And, and so I think that's kind of extended to the practices of, of how, how we, you know, rise to leadership or what leadership means. Etc. And so I think by being part of the SDC, um, what I'm sort of interested in, what SDC I think is interested in, is, it, is sort of um, making transparent what it is that we do. That it's not, a, you know, it's not a secret society. Um, <laughs> that you know, that art, that we are artists, and that is, you know, I don't know, special or whatever. But that's not also. <laughs> that's also not. Um, overuse that term in a way that cuts us off from um, transparency, uh, and that goes, and that's with everything, with um, identity and with um, diversity, etc. So I think that's uh, that is that is the form of leadership that I am taking at this at, at this moment. All right. Everybody, um, I am an actress and a director and a uh, teacher of acting, and also by Michelle Shea, <laughs> and also a healer. And and I'm including that because I got a Fox Foundation grant to study the connection between healing and acting for the purpose of knowing more than just falling into the power of what we do. I wanted to know what was it energetically that could uh, allow me as a performer, us as a performer, to connect more deeply with the hearts of the audience? Because for me, being an artist, especially an artist of color, had to do with people seeing each other in ways they could not see each other in 9 to 5 reality and hopefully uh, dissolving some of the issues that separate us from the huge humanity that we're all a part of. And I firmly believe in what we do as a, uh, an amazing place to research what it means to be human and to, through telling the stories that we, we live out of and creating meaning together, we confront in a community as an audience, the questions that face us about the phenomenon of being alive. And within this construct, um, it made me study many things and it invited me to many opportunities, one of which was to work as a leadership presence coach in a five-year program at Goddard Space Center at NASA for leadership development called Leadership Alchemy, which put me in the cauldron of what it means to be a leader when, of course, I wasn't thinking of myself that way. Mm -hmm. However, what was at stake for the scientists and engineers there was um, being able to make such an impact that they could get lots of money yeah. to do things to save our planet mm -hmm. and to explore space. So there was a lot at stake. And so I feel that the time that we're in right now, there is a lot at stake for us as a theater community because in the future, what theater is going to be is definitely not going to be like it was. Mm. Something else wants to come forth. Wow. Something else wants to be born. And we're in the question of what that is. We don't know what it is. But one thing that definitely is not going on the door is inclusion for everybody. Okay. And we don't know what that means. And we do have to, we live in, uh, as I've been contemplating all this, in a, uh, a world of duality meaning you know, the protagonist and antagonist exist at the same time. So somehow we have to make friends with what is. 
in a way that doesn't drive us crazy. Oh, so in this thing called culture that we talk about, we forget that we made it up. <laughs> it's the way we do things. And at one time, a couple of people got together and said, you know, this is a problem here. Let's do X, Y, or Z. Somebody else agreed, and then it became a culture, a family, a tribe, and eventually an institution that at one point was alive. Like all of Lort was an answer to problems. Yes. Then they became institutions, yes. which were buildings that got stuck in practices and ways of thinking, etc. Mm -hmm. And then it's a thing versus the people that are in it. And so part of our issue, I think, is finding where the real responsibility or the cause of the problem is. We can't find it because it's embedded in the networks of conversations we live on. Mm -hmm. Both the um, recognized conversations and most importantly, um, the web of deep emotional, I don't know what, garbage <laughs> from, the, from the private conversations we hold about each other and what's going on that we don't know what to do with. So this is what I'm hoping will change for us uh, during this research because to me, uh, we're at such an amazing place as human beings when we, we have the question of who are we beyond gender? And who are we within gender in terms of, for me I find, uh, I'm still trying to step into the power of being a woman, hmm. all of it and let go of all the programming about how dangerous it is, dangerous it is to do that. But, uh, and I, I believe that there, what's exciting about, I'm gonna call it the feminine versus feminine, is the principle of femininity. There is an aspect of irresistibility that's in it, that uh, how that's packaged, we can, uh, we can each explore in a way that I hope will soften the resistance that you inevitably will face anytime you're trying to do something different. That uh, antagonist is there in any sector anywhere. That's what I recognize now. But what we have is something that's so alive in theater that um, we have the potential through what we do on these little spaces to really cause something amazing to happen. And that leadership can happen from any place because anybody can be called at some point to be, to take center stage and the question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it?
One, a very famous director in San Francisco many years ago, I saw his play, The Tooth of Crime. <clears throat> and I, was, I wanted to work with him. And he said, uh, can you sing can you play an instrument? I wanted to act. I wanted his words in my mouth. And he needed to know could I act, could I sing or play an instrument? I went to Scripps College after the Medea project had blown up and I was asked to teach a class in artist social, uh, social activism. And I'm in the, uh, the professor's uh, house that, where, they, uh, where they house uh, visiting professors. And I uh, come down to breakfast and there's a gentleman sitting there, a uh, professor, and he says to me, he says, we need more milk. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Brown milk. <laughs> I said, that's, that's too goddamn bad. <laughs> together, we would be together, but I came home and my girlfriend set me up mm. with boys from high school. I went to this abandoned Victorian in the hate, she says, and uh, my girlfriend never showed up. And the guys were waiting for me upstairs in this house that was being renovated, and uh, they decided to get a place to play poker. And she said, I knew I was it. And they're all looking at me with wolf's eyes. And she said, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to take off my pants, but I'm going to leave my boots on, I'm going to leave my underwear on, and I'm going to leave my t-shirt on. And they're playing, she's uh, getting undressed, but there's a bag of cocaine and money on the table. This girl, Tanya, wherever you are, bless you. She says, I'm watching that money. And by now, I am like so pissed off at the world and at love and at my girlfriend. She said that there was a moment in time that said, it's now or never. She said, I snatched the money. And I started running. And I jumped over the railing. And she's, she can't breathe now. She's like, and, and we're at 850 Bryant Street. And she's like, and, and I ran out to the streets and there was a lady that nearly hit me. And I told the lady, I said, those guys are chasing me. She said, Miss Jones, I was holding on to the money and the, and the cocaine. And then she said, it was a lady that took me to Daly City away from there. And the women around, all these black and brown women around her, and I'm saying, catch her, catch her, catch her. Because she was falling. She couldn't breathe. She said, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and we lifted her. And I said, 
you live to tell the story. The Medea Project is my contribution to theater, because I think it's time, as Michelle was saying, that we're building something else. Something else is coming. And I find that incarcerated women, what they need is the freedom of voice to say where they've been, because baby, you want drama. Mm. <laughs> you want drama. I met a young woman in prison, in the jail, who killed her baby in a cocaine hallucination, and the, the Medea Project's name grew out of that because she said, my husband wanted me gone. Because she like, got really addicted to coke, and he could do coke all weekend and then go to work, but I was out every day looking for more coke. And I started to study about tolerance in women and men and drugs. And this young lady, uh, he, her husband said, I want you gone, you're, you're a junkie. I want you gone, the corner, the corner don't want you. And she said, oh really, you want me gone? He said, all I want out of, excuse my language, all I want out of this motherfucker is my baby. I want you gone. And she said, really? And she said, he went to bed. She said, and I smothered my baby. I smothered that baby because that's what I could do. And I'm thinking Medea, you know? I mean, it's like, whoa, this is Medea, the highest order. And so she would say to me, I'm, I'm not going to the gym. I'm waiting to die. I'm going to heaven because only God can judge me. And the stories started happening. Women started telling these amazing stories about survival. And they didn't know. They were, the, the stories were driven in shame and sorrow. And they were just so embarrassed that they had failed the system. I said, you failed a system that was not of your design. And as I sat here this morning, listen to men versus women in legitimate theater. It's the same old bullshit. <laughs> and I, I think about... As I thought about, yes, darling, you're the baby, baby's lovely, she's talking back. <laughs> I think about how to close all of this, and I wanted to ask you to help me participate. John, the ghost in this place. Um, I wanted to think about how could we close this session. And I want to say that I've been doing this now for almost 50 years, theater with incarcerated women. I've been doing theater around the world. I have a theater company in Africa. Medea in Africa. I am uh, working with UC Medical Center as an artist, working with women who are dealing with trauma and living with HIV. And it's something called performance as medicine. Mm. And it's been an amazing situation with the hospital, with the clinic, for them to watch our performances. A young woman, uh, Bianca uh, Henry, wrote The Ugly Duckling. I asked her to translate The Ugly Duckling from your story, and that's what you just experienced. Duck all fucked up in time. <laughs> and these are methodologies that I developed. I, but I bring in the myth, because the myth is something that we all understand. It's, it's the universal language, is it not? Mm -hmm. Talk to me, is it not? Yes. Yeah. And it's the place where I think we intersect with our artist social change, with classic theater. I'm, going, I'm about to go on the road with two of my uh, performers, one who's living with HIV and the other who's been with me for 20 years, she was a former meth addict. But we're going to Rutgers, we're going to Princeton, and we're going to Howard to work with uh, uh, classical literature. With these women are gonna go in and teach theater artists uh, uh, their, from their standpoint, what is classical literature. Mm. And I, I applaud these schools because they sent for us. Because it's time. We're building something else here. And women uh, sit at the center of so much, whether we like it or not. And women, we have to get with it. Okay? I was at a, I was at a, um, I was at a meeting with um, Alicia Garza in February at Hamilton College, and everybody wanted to talk about, uh, well, you know, she talked. She was about to begin a, a thing on Black Lives Matter, but everybody wanted to talk about what happened to Huey P. Newton and why he turned out to be such a drug addict. Blah 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 blah. blah. And then everybody went on to ask her, well, what do you do about self-care? And she said, I'm not interested in self-care. No. I'm interested in collective care. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that includes all of us. Collective care. It's about me wanting to know, how are you doing? 
How are you doing? If we're trying to do this theater thing, we need to come in. If, you don't, if you're not looking so good, girl, I want to be able to say, go home. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> and I'd like for you to just help me end this with um, a piece that we wrote. A young woman named Bianca Robinson was in my first group at uh, the county jail. And Bianca Robinson's daughter was killed in a car at a car in the Tenderloin while Bianca was in jail for prostitution. And Bianca lost it. She was howling, Medea. She's howling in this solitary confinement. Her baby has just been blown away. And she says, they gotta let me go home. I said, Mr. She said, Ms. Jones, they have, I said, they don't let you do nothing. They put you in lockdown because they're afraid that you will hurt yourself or somebody else. And the rest of us talked about what, what's going on here. And we wrote a piece as a group entitled, Nobody Told Her. And I think it resonates with today. So if every time I say nobody told her, you say nobody. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ready. Nobody told her. Nobody. Now she can't believe it when it's said. Nobody. Born behind the eight ball, nobody. life's a house of cards. Everything's fine as long as there's no wind. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. That it would all be blown away. Her house, her money, her children, her love, her life. Nobody told her. Nobody. That the one waiting on the street corner in that alleyway, in that hotel room, nobody told her. Nobody. That she's the one who loses it all. Nobody told her that not much was expected of her. You got it. <laughs> And therefore, she doesn't have to hope for much. Nobody told her Nobody. that she's getting on that train, in that car, and she's caught in the traffic. And what is this destination? West Highway, Ellis and Taylor, Cap Street, Subic Bay. Nobody told her. Nobody, Nobody told her. Nobody. That while doing time for prostitution, trying to get enough money to feed her baby, nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her nobody. that her baby's brains would be splattered on the back seat of a car in the tenderloin. Nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her. Nobody. So how in the hell could she know? Nobody told. Thank you very much. Exempt. 
They're tax exempt because the government is determined uh, determined that because they give a social service to the community, they should be exempt from taxes. And who pays the taxes? The people. In Los Angeles, people of color are the majority. We're paying taxes. We are not represented. All right, now, uh, two weeks ago, Hilda Solis, a Latina, basically changed the face of the Music Center Board. It's 50% now people of color. Hilda Solis, a woman, a woman of color. And now there's two plays uh, Latino, people of color in the season. I don't think that's ever happened before. So as we go into the sessions, I, don't, I think we can't forget this is a nonprofit. We are paying taxes. We are going to be the majority of people of color within the next 20 years. So as a strategy for, for moving forward, I'm very pragmatic. <laughs> uh, I think that would be a great strategy to discuss further here today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mia Fairweather. I'm an actress and writer. Thank you for holding this space um, for all of us. I think one of the things that stood out to me was the notion of having to earn your space. Um, and I feel like, um, as an actor and writer, it's very interesting in where you can get your stories from, but when you want to share it, the question that people ask is, have you been a playwright? Which, in my case, as an actor, I had to write my own monologues to give voice to the things I wanted to say. So in many ways, I felt like that's me writing. However, I'm not in a formal program, which I felt was very limiting in the way people saw who can write plays and content that could be for theater. The other thing, as Ms. Um, Rodessa Jones just shared, um, I'm from New York. Recently, I lived in Los Angeles the last two years. I moved to the Bay three months ago. The interesting thing is that in LA, the place I felt most comfortable is Skid Row. It wasn't theater. It wasn't anywhere else, because that's where the stories are. That's where the vulnerability is. So as far as experience and who gets to tell stories, there are so many people in those communities who are homeless, who are artists, who are individuals with stories, but oftentimes aren't given the space to share them. So I think in some of the change, I mean, some of as you know, part of the younger generation, I guess, of this movement is being inclusive on where you seek the talent mm -hmm. that can potentially have the content mm -hmm. to bring in the audiences because our, there's a lot of people, friends of mine, where we're more interested. I want you to save this for your breakout session. Okay, no, no, no. I'm just saying, just looking for where inclusion and where that, um, where the stories can come from versus what looks good on the resume and what's quantifiable because that doesn't always bring in the new stories. <laughs> Juice, just draw truth. Right. Yeah. So my name is Layla Miranda. I'm a former board member for the Playwright Center of San Francisco, former executive director for one of the most productions, and soon to be announced artistic director for another theater company. Hey. Yeah. So, um, I'm speaking from the experience of smaller theaters, which in this community there are hundreds of us, and we are struggling a lot. So my four thoughts that I had quickly were cost of being in leadership in a small theater company means paying out of pocket. So a lot of us that are in those leadership positions, we pay hundreds, thousands of dollars into making our productions happen because we don't get funding. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about was peer mentorship. So there aren't a lot of opportunities for those mentorship. I find that in a lot of ways we end up finding peer mentors, so you're learning as you go, and I think that that's an important aspect of mentorship. And then the second thing was that, um, though I'm not a founder, in those smaller theater companies, that skill set is still there. Doing everything from marketing and website development, through fundraising, through everything. So I'd just like those things to also be discussed. And then the last thing was, I just, it's a comment slash question. Um, in terms of personal familiarity, where we're talking about that was the one area that women had advantage. One of the quotes up there said that it cited, well, because of recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. In the converse of that, does that mean that the men had less favorable recommendations? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, my name is Emily Murase. I work for Mayor Ed Lee as head of the San Francisco Department on the Status of Women. Woo! And this is well, very new to me, but the issues 
piece or not, and I just wanted to offer two potential resources. One is we've created the San Francisco Gender Equality Principles Initiative. We've talked to architects, we've talked to advertising creative directors. The issues are very similar. So it's at www.genderprinciples.org with very granular level interventions that folks might want to think about. Secondly, one strategy that we found very successful is to throw out a challenge to major corporations to increase the number of women in leadership all throughout the corporation to adopt some of these granular level uh, uh, interventions. So I recommend that as a potential strategy. Thank you for coming. And on the lines of potential strategy, my name is Kristen Vangenhoven. I'm the artistic director of Wham Theater in the beautiful Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, one of those founders who does everything. And uh, as this idea has been brewing over the last few days that I've been talking about with a few people, in order to reframe the future of leadership, I think a Leadership Institute Summit is in order. So I think uh, we should keep our eyes open, you should all keep your eyes open, for something that really addresses the nuts and bolts of the skills that have been addressed in this report as a beginning, as a next strategy, as an action move, uh, as a Berkshire Leadership Summit for Aspiring Women Leaders. So I put it out there, so now I'll make it happen. Woo! Hi. Um, I want to second that about skills building. I think that that's so important and something else that we're really interested in working on in the Theater Bay Area. But what I want to um, ask and kind of throw to you is a question about resources and cost, because that's certainly something that's come up a lot um, in, in our conversations. And really, where where's the funding? Where's the funding for the study? Where's the funding for next steps? Yeah. You are the goddess of that. Yeah. So, I know, it always comes down to nickels and dimes. So, so, hold on, I'm going to answer this because it's really important that we hear this. Um, and, and that those of you who can make something happen, keep making it happen. Um, we started the study with zero. We went to the Tulman Foundation. I hope Alex is listening on this howl round because Tulman led it. The Valentine Foundation led this. Lots of individual people on our Indiegogo led it. We were determined to really support a long-term research deep dive and to make this convening free. So we are still $30,000 away from the goal that we need to complete this research. And all of you listening out there, if this is important to you, figure out a way to help us match this and get this done. It will get done because it's fierce. And once it gets done, that $30,000, then what we want to do is convene a wider discussion among funders who care about this, about where those priorities are and how we can direct resources towards uh, some of these granular things that could get supported in the American theater in the future. So, 30,000. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> okay. Final three. Go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Julie Phelps. I'm the Artistic Director of Counterpulse. Um, one thing that came to mind to me today while I was listening and also some of the provocations from the panelists around building something new was looking towards where women have leadership and how women have leadership, not only looking towards the places where men have leadership and how women can aspire to attain that type of leadership. And I think it would be an interesting complement to today's study to look at how women are actually taking leadership in the arts field and how we can learn from what's coming from that leadership. Instead of just saying, oh, you're not the ED, you're not the AD, therefore there is no leadership, because I don't believe that's true. It's not my experience. So how are we taking leadership is something I want to discuss in the breakouts today. I'm Omi Jones, and I'm an artist scholar. And I want to say first that this is just fabulous, having this experience and to all the people who made this possible. Two quick things. One, to underscore the need for more study, so that now I know I need to go on the Indiegogo campaign and put in some money and encourage people to do that. This is one of many very important things that came up. Will those women who appear to be next in line to be ADs or EDs, do they want it? And five years from now, will they have gotten that? So a follow-up study, I think, is really important. The second thing, very quickly, I think it's important to note the variety of presentational styles that were part of this gathering because changing the skin color, changing the genitalia of leadership does not guarantee a change right. in the aesthetic, does not change diversity in the ways that some of us wanted. But the presentations here suggested the kind of variety that I mean when I say diversity. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Williams, I work for Berkeley Rap, and I just wanted to 
speak to some other um, research and initiatives that are being developed by Lord in particular. This, this conversation, like we said, it's not new. People are talking about it. People in my generation are talking about all generations. And, and Lord in particular, are looking at how we can expand access to and education about leaders, top leadership positions. And so from those conversations, what kind of has come out of that, in addition to more questions, is a program that's really focused on mentorship, and I'm hoping to talk more about it in the mentorship group, but it's about giving women and people of color access to those top leadership positions through training programs. And so we're working to get it funded um, because Kind of I, one of the quotes up there that I saw earlier was about, you know, we're tired of working for free, but there's these programs and ideas people have, but it does take money to make sure that people can be compensated for the work that they're doing. And so right now, one of the biggest barriers, I think, is getting those programs funded. And they're really fantastic ideas, and we all want them to happen, but we can't just make them happen out of thin air. So something to think about um, as we talk this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, just a huge yelp of gratitude to this amazing group of people for yeah. 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 it. Been back like a long time, and it's uh, amazing to hear. So, if you're just here for this morning, we thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming. Um, spread the word and uh, and keep the conversation going. If you signed up to be part of a breakout session this afternoon. Please, as you walk out of here, head on upstairs to a room that's called The Roof, uh, our E-U-F-F, -F, but it means up on the roof, um, for lunch, and then we will steer you towards your breakout session. So thank you to everybody. We'll see you up.